Here's a guy that might be able to use a hose to, well, get a breath of fresh air as he's miring around in the swamp. We have Senator James Lankford on us this morning. Senator, are you there? I'm doing very well, and I'm here, and I could use that hose to clean out the barn. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, you're going to have to have a pretty big hose from the way I understand it. Senator, uh, just uh, so many things going on right now, and uh, you and I talked uh, briefly before we went on the air. You guys are looking at stuff that hasn't even been written and voting on it. What's what's going on there? So we're, we're reaching an all-time new low, and, I, and I, that, that's good for even D.C.'s sake to say it. We all remember Nancy Pelosi saying we've got to vote on it uh, so we can find out what's in it. Schumer is actually bringing the infrastructure bill up today and wants to do a vote on it, uh. but it's not even been written yet. Literally, no one has read it because they're still writing it and still pulling it together. We've all seen like a one-page summary document that says this is full of loving kittens and good things, uh, but there's no detail, no no information, no actual final cost estimate, and he wants to bring it up for the first vote today. So we're saying a- absolutely not, and every sane person should say absolutely not on this. So we'll we'll block it from coming, actually. We'll have enough votes to be able to block it from coming to the floor today. But this is a new low in being irrational. Uh, so, uh, again, I- infrastructure is not the problem. It's what they're doing. They're literally making something nonpartisan partisan. And I guarantee you tonight on the national news, they will blame Republicans for blocking a reasonable infrastructure bill that's not even been written. And it's not about infrastructure. I mean, if you look at uh, the uh, the ins and outs and some of the things that they're wanting to put in there, even if you, can, even if you could look at it, there's a whole, whole lot of pork in this thing. Well, at the end of the day, we have no idea yet. Uh, we've heard what we've heard on it, uh, that there is a lot of climate change work on it. There's a lot of other things that are in it, uh, but we have no idea what's really in it at this point. And, I, I, again, I go back to why would they make something as, as nonpartisan as infrastructure, mm-hmm. such a partisan deal, and they're suddenly trying to be able to twist everything on it. And we'll, we'll, we'll see. I, I guarantee they'll blame Republicans the fact that this vote goes down today. But I would tell you I would proudly say it should go down today, uh, because it's not reasonable to be able to vote on something literally no one's even seen. And it would be monumental to uh, vote on this, uh, you know, of course, on National Ice Cream Day week, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let, let, me, let me give you a side note on National Let's Ice Cream Week. Have you, have you seen Ben and Jerry's, what they have done? No. Ben, ben and Jerry's, which is a Vermont-based, very liberal company, they're now... Uh, saying that they're not going to sell ice cream in sections of Israel to support the Palestinians. And uh, they're, wow. they're going to boycott certain areas where they won't sell ice cream in those areas. If I was the Israelis, I would say, keep your Vermont ice cream. We don't want it here either way. And quite frankly, as Oklahomans, a lot of people don't know, Oklahoma passed a law last year saying if a company boycotts, uh, Israel uh, and says that they're going to boycott, divest, and sanction Israel. If a company chooses to do that, the state of Oklahoma can then boycott that company and say, you can't sell your product in any of our state facilities. So I would encourage, if Ben and Jerry's is going to boycott Israel and to say they're going to stand with the Palestinian people and boycott Israel, uh, uh, the state of Oklahoma should enforce its own law and to say we're not going to allow Ben and Jerry's ice cream to be sold in any state-owned facility. And uh, that, that's a reasonable response from us. But, uh, the, yeah, let, let's celebrate National Ice Cream Week by eating Brahms, not eating Ben and Jerry. <laughs> Absolutely. Go. Absolutely. Good stuff right there. And uh, so back to the to matter at hand. We've been talking about um, uh, this BLM situation and uh, the nominee. We know that uh, you're starting to gain some support in understanding that the, the, the young lady that – Biden Good. wants to stick up there is a, is a spiker. Yep. So when we say BLM, we have to figure out which one it is. That's not the Black Lives Matter leadership. <laughs> right. That's yeah. actually Good the call. Bureau of Land Management uh, group. This works for the Department of Interior. Uh, the person that Biden has uh, recommended and nominated, we're actually continue to be able to push through. Uh, years ago, when she was in a, in college, uh, she was very active with the Earth First group, and all of us that are in energy country know exactly what Earth First is known for in their radical environmentalism. Uh, but she was also involved in the group that was actually spiking trees mm. and trying to be able to protect trees in a forest. Spiking trees is a good way to be able to kill a logger, uh, because when they go through and actually chainsaw a tree down, uh, they hit that metal spike in the tree and it breaks the saw and it comes right back at them. Uh, so she was involved in that, 
And uh, we've been very, very clear, this is not the kind of person uh, that we would want to have leading the Bureau of Land Management that was literally involved in spiking trees in the past in a radical environmental group uh, that was involved in eco-terrorism. Uh, so we, we've been pretty clear on it. There are other questions and issues that are out there as well uh, that we would say surely there's someone else that can lead the Bureau of Land Management other than this person. Yeah, and uh, does it seem like she's uh, doing anything except trying to lie about it? Uh, here, another situation that we have, you know, we're pretty close to here, and that, that's this border crisis, and it is a crisis. It, it, it is a out-of-control situation that um, everybody's, I mean, you've been down there. You've seen it firsthand. You know wow. what's going on, and, and the, the people that are trying to combat it, they, they get told one thing, and they have to do another. This What is going on here? Yeah, so I, I've actually put out a report just today as we continue to be able to focus on this issue. Uh, we've been tracking uh, when Biden actually stopped construction of the border wall, what happened? Uh, because he announced on January the 20th, we're going to stop and we're going to study this. We're going to do 60 days to study it. It's now been 100 and I think 85 days into his presidency, and uh, he's still, quote unquote, studying it. But here's what the real cost of that is. It has cost federal taxpayers $2 billion, billion with a B, two billion dollars for him to not mm. do construction he is literally paying contractors not to build the wall and then we're also paying individuals to sit next to the steel in the desert that's on the floor of the, of the desert floor to make sure it's not actually stolen well there's a good way to keep that steel from being stolen how about installing it <laughs> uh, if you actually install it rather than pay people to sit next to it uh, then that money would not be wasted. Uh, he, uh, Biden is perpetually blaming Trump for everything and saying, if Trump supports this, uh, then I'm opposed to it. The career professionals uh, at uh, DHS are the ones that actually said, this is the right place to be able to put it. President Trump just didn't flippantly say, let's go build a wall in all these places. There was an actual study that was done by career professionals at DHS to be able to look at where do we need additional infrastructure, where do we need to be able to block illegal entry, what would that look like? That was the fencing that was actually being built, and uh, Biden is stepping in the way of it and is literally pouring $2 billion down the drain that we're paying contractors not to do construction at this point, and that's just so far. Uh, there's lots of other issues. The, the other big issue no one's talking about is there have been 35,000 people that have been allowed into the country because the line was so long uh, coming across the border that the Border Patrol have been instructed when the line gets long, just release people into the country uh. and tell them to check themselves in when they get to whatever city they're going to, <laughs> go to an ICE agent and check yourself in. That's happening. That's oh, wow. <laughs> 35,000 people so far this year have just been released in the country and says, line's long, we're going to try to keep the line short, so wherever you go, check in when you get there, actually. It's been absolutely absurd. I bet the lines uh, to check in at those ICE uh, offices aren't very long. I'm just you guessing. Know, I have to tell you, I, I've been shocked because I've been tracking all these numbers down to be able to find out. About 18% uh, of the people that came across the border that way actually did check in, <laughs> but that means 82% of the people, we have no idea where they are. And how many, you, of how many are getting COVID tested? Uh, you know what? They don't get COVID tested at the border. They're released out, and they tell them there is a uh, nonprofit, non-governmental organization right over there, and they will actually do the COVID testing for you. And they then send them over there, quote unquote, so they have no idea if they actually do it uh, and actually get the COVID test or what the results are. And as you and I both know from tracking COVID, uh, you can have COVID in the early stages and you don't actually show a positive, so you've got to do two tests to really be able to evaluate that a couple of days apart. There's no one getting the second test. Uh, well, uh, the test seems to be a little skewed, too. Uh, just ask the, the Democrats that went on their little um, junket. <laughs> hey, they're still here. Uh, they're, they're still enjoying Washington, D.C. while we're working. They're hanging out sightseeing and uh, trying to keep Texas from actually improving their voting yeah. laws. And hanging their underwear, doing their laundry in their bathroom. That's that's good stuff right there. Okay, also, 2.2 million passports are delayed. Let's talk yeah. about this. Yeah, th this is something we actually started during the, during the time of the Trump administration because the State Department was falling farther and farther behind. But at the time, when we worked with the Trump administration, they accelerated and said, you're right, Let's try to figure this out. Then they started actually improving service on it. That's a good thing. Since President Biden has come in, 
Uh, only a third of the uh, folks working for State Department are actually coming in the office. Obviously, people are traveling again. They're finding out that their passport expired last year, and so they've got to get their passport renewed. And uh, so you've got m- these two-plus million passports that are backlogged. State Department is still only bringing a third of their workforce in. So while the rest of the country is all back at work, 2.2 million passports in backlog. Uh, so people, even people paying for expedited, they would get their passport back. So we're, we're not asking something complicated. We're asking State Department workers to actually come back to work. That's number one. Catch up with the backlog is number two. And then we're trying to work with all the outside contractors that are also behind for State Department that they have not uh, actually pushed the issue with those contractors as well to be able to do their stuff. People need to be, get access to this. And, and people that are flying even, some folks that don't have a driver's license need a passport to be able to fly. This, yeah. this is not some flippant document just for somebody that's going down to Mexico. Uh, this is something that's needed for a lot of folks just as a formal document. Crazy stuff. Of course, uh, uh, Taylor Bradley's about uh, threatening to go Jen Psaki on me so because uh, we're running out of time. <laughs> Love that gal. Anyway, um, uh, very quickly, just to, just to wrap things up, Senator Joe Manchin kind of seems to be something that's um, uh, helping us out on the Senate floor. He is trying to keep sanity among his party and has a very hard time doing that. Uh, he keeps turning around to his own party and saying, are we crazy? Why are we doing this? This is not good. Uh, this is not right policy on that. Um, Kirsten Cinema is the other one from Arizona uh, that she's been really solid trying to be able to push her own party to say this is not reasonable. But I would tell you, we'll, we'll see in the days ahead. They're talking about a three and a half trillion dollar tax and spending spree is what they want to do after this infrastructure bill, whatever that ends up being. Uh, they want to do a three and a half trillion dollar bill. To tell you how crazy that is. Typical total spending for an entire year for the federal government is right at $4 trillion. That's Social Security, that's Medicare, that's national defense, that's education, that's everything, right at $4 trillion. They want to do an additional bill of $3.5 trillion of new entitlements, of all kinds of new programs. This is literally just flipping money over to people and uh, writing checks and sending them in the mail. They want to do that and create all these new entitlements. They want to spend total this year between the COVID bill in March what they want to do in infrastructure, what they want to do in the budget, what they want to do in this big tax and spending spree bill they've got. They want to do $12 trillion in spending this year is what they're pushing. And when I had people last year saying if Biden gets in, this is going to be the biggest tax and spend president yeah. ever, they said, no, Biden's a moderate. He's not mm-hmm. like that. This is literally the biggest tax and spend presidency ever and they continue to be able to bolt towards that so if mansion and cinema don't hold them back that's exactly what we're headed towards and then we can continue to argue it and push it uh, but if that's the direction that they want to go they have one vehicle this budget vehicle that only requires 51 votes they have the 51 b- votes if biden and uh and uh i'm sorry if cinema and mansion don't hold true on it Wow. Well, we'll pray for that, uh, Senator. We'll pray for you, too. Again, uh, thank you for your stance on pro-life and, and, and America first. we got to have it. And, and yep. so uh, keep fighting the good fight, and if there's anything we can do, let us know. Uh, U.S. Senator James Lankford, ladies and gentlemen, have a blessed day, buddy. You as well. Take care. All right. Thank you.